So we picked up our session the next week pretty much where we left off. Fang and Sindal were right down the hole standing next to each other, surrounded by porcupines. Tika, Tiki and Pema were the floor above them, trying to figure out where they went and how they were going to save them. And uh, the porcupines were just starting to wake up, I think. So uh, let's get into it, shall we? As you can see, first off here, we have the picture of the diagram, or the diagram of the, the, the second chamber that they entered. And uh, you can see that there's uh, several stone benches there, those gray bars. And, uh, those have all been kind of pushed to the side of the chamber um, because of the porcupines have, you know, bedded down in the center area of this chamber. And you can see that there's also two large statues at either end of the, at the back end of the chamber. Those statues are facing each other um, towards this, this podium that is also sitting over there. Now, you can also, um, they know that they're, um, the players, actually, they were level 6 at this point. That's a, that's a, that's a good point to have. And um, they had several advantages for this fight, so that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as one-sided as it might have appeared at first. Uh, their first advantage was that the porcupines were sleeping when they arrived. Uh, there was combat before upstairs, but it was pretty brief, and they weren't woken up by any of that combat. Second off, um, there, they had a, the dust cloud that uh, Fang had made, and that shrouded vision passed five feet. And what that meant is that the porcupines, um, because they're large creatures, they have a reach. They have a five-foot reach, so technically they threaten squares that are ten feet away from them. Well, they couldn't threaten those squares because they couldn't see those squares, and so they, that actually helped save them quite a bit. Um, however, they also had quite a few things that were working against them. They were outnumbered by porcupines. Even with uh, even with all the whole party there, they were still outnumbered uh, four to five. There were five porcupines to the four members of the party. Another thing, these were adult porcupines. These were uh, not like the ones they fought before. This is how I retconned, um, how I forgot the quill damage from last session. I retconned it by saying that the ones they fought last session were juveniles. Those were like baby porcupines, and their quills hadn't quite grown in um, to be as long and um, long and hard as, as the adults were. So uh, these were adults, and they actually had the quill damage now, and I remembered it for this fight, and it was uh, quite fun, actually. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, also, they, um, one of them was a boss. One of these porcupines, you can see on the diagram there, is actually a little bit larger than the other ones. And that is not just a, a mess up on my part. That porcupine was a little bit larger. And in addition to that, he had a slightly higher AC, and he had a way more hit points. And um, I want to quickly mention this quill damage, um, because it's kind of, it was a fun mechanic. It was really good um, for my players. I thought it was good for this game specifically. Um, I had very traditionally minded players, and they were very used to using their swords and arrows and stuff like that to try to solve their problems. It was harder for me to get them to use their bending in combat situations. Well, it only took one quill to the hand for them to figure out, like, hey, we don't want to be attacking these things with our swords and fists. We want to be using our bending blasts, and we want to attack at a range. Um, that was previously quite difficult to do. Um, but now we'll quickly jump back to the fight here. Uh, the players had a surprise round. As I, as, uh, as I said, the porcupines were waking up just now, and they, they weren't fully aware of what was happening. So Fang and Sindal, essentially, and Tiki and Pema, they all had a surprise round. And so everyone rolled initiatives, and everyone acted. Fang and Sindal took stock of their surroundings as the porcupines were beginning to wake up. As Tiki and Pema uh, tried to race downstairs as fast as they could so that they could regroup with uh, Fang and Sin. Early on in the fight, I'm pretty sure Fang was using some of his earthbending to try to throw dust or dirt into the, the porcupine's eyes and blind them, and he actually managed to succeed on a couple of those, I believe. Meanwhile, Sindal, while at this point, was uh, trying to make his way around one of the porcupines. He was trying to get into flanking with, uh, with Fang on one of these porcupines, and he got into flanking, and on that turn, he made an attack, and that is when he discovered the quill damage. 1d6 damage on a melee attack. The player must make a reflex save, DC 19, or they get stuck with 1d4 quills in their hand. And he failed that save. I think he got like two quills stuck in his hand. When you have those quills in your hand, you take a minus one to attacks, saves, and checks until they are removed. And removing them, each quill takes a DC 20 heal check as a full round action. And if you don't meet that DC 20 heal check, you essentially do another 1d6 damage as you remove each quill from your hand. So, uh, yeah. He only needed one of those to realize that, uh, you know, trying to punch these things was not a good idea. And then he jumped back and he was uh, trying to use his fire blasting for, for the rest of the fight. 
Around this point, Tiki and Pema had made their way back into the chamber, and both of them were busy uh, providing range support pretty much for the entire fight, while Fang and Sindal tried to keep these uh, porcupines locked down so that they couldn't uh, threaten anyone else. Uh, Tiki was alternating between her arrows and her water blasts. They both did about the same damage, and she was kind of torn over which one she should use, and so she ended up alternating a little bit. Whereas Pema pretty much stuck strictly with her air blasts. Um, those were touch uh, armor class to hit. She only had she had to hit their touch AC, which uh, made it quite a bit easier for a lot of these opponents. And uh, so she stuck with her air blasts the whole time, I believe. At some point, I believe Pema was also trying to blind porcupines um, using some dirt and uh, her air blasts, essentially. And she managed to succeed on one of those, I believe, pretty much as um, Fang's dust blinding um, had begun to wear off. Um, Pema had hit the same one again, and so um, those blinded porcupines were kind of just like meandering around the room the whole time, just kind of angrily um, just trying to find something to bash, but they couldn't see anything. And so um, that also helped save them. You know, the, um, the, any porcupine that was blinded was a porcupine that they didn't have to deal with. It was a porcupine that was uh, just wandering around, and and they were just kind of mindlessly, or not mindlessly, but like aimlessly wandering, and I just kind of did it randomly, and it just, no one, them, they'd never really hit any of the players, and so there wasn't really a problem. Um, eventually, though, this, this big boss porcupine, this big bad guy, comes up, and um, he starts getting into the fray, and um, he didn't really do any more damage than the other porcupines. He was just harder to hit, and he was a lot tougher. So, um, yeah, he was just a lot bigger and a lot tougher. And I don't remember the exact play-by-play, -play, you know, of this entire fight. I'm just trying to give you, like, the highlights of, you know, the stuff that I specifically remember. One of the highlights of this fight that I remember was that Fang managed to trap one of these porcupines with a stone column. I think it was one of the ones who was blinded, and it was a, around one of the corners or one of the edges of the wall outside of combat with everyone else. And he had a free moment. He just used his earthbending to pull up a giant stone column underneath it and smash it up into the ceiling. And it failed its reflex save, and so it took a bunch of smash or cr crushing damage from his column. And um, when it was Fang's turn again, he was like, it's still up there, it hasn't escaped yet. And I was like, no, he failed his escape artist check, he's still stuck. He's like, alright, I'm just gonna bring it down and then bring it back up and crush him again. <laughs> oh, jeez, man, I was like, oh my god, that's like, so brutal. I never would have thought of that, but it's kind of brilliant and it totally worked. He only had to do that like two or three times and that porcupine was just like a bloody pulp smeared across the ceiling pretty much. Very graphic stuff. Around this point, the blindness of the porcupines was beginning to wear off and now they were uh, having to deal with pretty much all of them. But that was okay because a couple were beginning to fall by this point. Sindal managed to take one down with his fire bending, and uh, Tiki managed to take one down with her, um, with her uh, attacks as well. And then, um, Sindal, he was sticking mostly to the shadows the whole time, I'm pretty sure. He was a roguish type, and he was trying to use his fire blast as, like, a sneak attack or something like that, and just trying to stay out of melee range with these things. Whereas Tiki was just focusing her attacks on one, uh, one after the other until, you know, she managed to bring it down. Um, belie I believe Pema, I think she managed to take down two, but I'm not positive on that. I think she might have taken down two of these things. One of them, I'm pretty sure, was the boss. And um, I'm pretty sure that it was because of her air blasts. Again, she only had to hit their touch AC. So even though she was only doing 1d6 damage, she was hitting these things pretty much every round, which most of the other players weren't for this fight. And the really cool thing about this fight is that, um, I mean, it was a great fight. It was very intense, and it, it took pretty much the whole session to do this one fight, this one combat. And, um, and it got pretty brutal. Fang um, got pretty low. He was stayed in melee combat with these uh, porcupines for almost the entire fight. And he took quite a bit of damage in that amount of time. Um, it was just a good fight. You know, everyone was like, you know, it was a, it was really challenging. They had to work with each other. They had to strategize and cooperate. And they did an excellent job. And everyone managed to get a kill, essentially. Everyone brought down a porcupine, which I thought was cool. A lot of times that doesn't happen, you know. One person, you know, the tank or the, the DPS will get all of the kills, whereas, you know, everyone else is kind of just stuck there being like, I managed to get, like, a couple hits in, and that was about it. No, not in this case. Everyone managed to bring one down, which is, I think, is rewarding for the players. You know, that way they all feel like they actually physically did something. They can actually see their, their, what they have done. You know what I mean? 
So now that the fight's over, they have an opportunity to actually investigate this large worship chamber. That's the whole reason they're here. They need to figure out why the spirit is attacking, and they need to figure out how to get it to stop attacking. So they had them block the stream. The water was able to flow through the temple freely. It follows the grooves throughout the temple, and it leads to these statues in the, in the bottom temple room, the big temple room that they just fought in. And those, there's small grates below those statues, and it appears that the water is going down those grates. And um, as this water is going down the grates, they notice that the eyes of the statues begin to glow ever so faintly with this, uh, this pale white-blue light. And uh, now they know that something is here, they just don't know where exactly, or what it is. Um, but they do remember hearing something while they were doing investigation about an offering of old, something like that. Or it was inscribed on one of the reliefs or something like that, it was just something... It was to give them a clue, like, hmm, what would an offering of old be? And they have to do, like, well, maybe some knowledge history checks or something. Or they have to ask some people to be like, well, what was some of the offerings they brought? Well, they, they know that the offerings that were typically brought to this temple turned out to be gold, typically. It was just, like, a bunch of gold. People would bring money to the temple, and that was their offering. So, um... I, I'm, I'm not sure if I said it explicitly stated that it was money, but I might have implied it very heavily that it was like gold. And again, this is me trying to take back some of the wealth that I gave them um, in the in the very first episode when they defeated the, the sea serpent. Uh, so I, I, I've been trying to steal their gold this whole time, and I have, as of yet, been unsuccessful. But um, Fang notices that the podium is made of this weird material, and it seems to have a sort of a weighted trigger on top of some kind. And he figures out that it looks like this trigger is probably activated by a specific weight. A specific weight lowers this to a specific level, and that triggers whatever this does. Whatever it does. I don't know. Um, he tries to bend it. He's like, his first thought is, I'm going to try to bend this thing and just work it down until I hit the right weight. I realized pretty quickly if he could use his bending, then this would not be much of a tr trouble. It wouldn't be much of a puzzle, which is originally what I wanted it to be. And so I was like, no, it's actually made of this weird shell stuff. You can't seem, you don't seem to be able to bend it. It doesn't look like it's wood, though. You knock on it, and it doesn't sound like wood, and it doesn't feel like wood. It feels kind of like a coarse-ish stone, but and not like a smooth, like none that you've ever felt. So I don't know. Um, he tries instead. <laughs> Instead, he's like, hmm, way to trigger, yada yada, okay, can't move the actual podium or the trigger itself. What if I just uh, take some of these stone benches? I'm going to take chunks of this stone bench over here and put it on the way to trigger until I hit the exact weight. And that way I don't have to just lump on a bunch of gold. I think it was supposed to be like 200 gold that I wanted them to put on top of this, this pad to open up the secret chamber. And um, again, I realized, like, man, this is, this is, uh, this is, man, this is... I didn't think this puzzle all the way through, <laughs> and um, I'm, I realized I couldn't really stop them at this point. I figured I should probably just let them have it, because if I tried to continue fighting them and coming up with reasons why it didn't work, I, that's just me trying to defeat them. That's not what the game is about. If they come up with a way to beat the game, the game that you created, then they should get to beat it. That's, that's their reward for outsmarting you. So, I let Fang have his win, and after a few tries, he manages to get the correct weight on this, uh, on this podium. And he sees, boo -doo, boo -doo, boo -doo, a secret door opens up, and um, it leads to, uh, well, it has a set of stairs that goes downwards. And now that's pretty cool, and that's their reward. They, they managed to beat the puzzle without putting in the gold. Well, they also managed to activate a trap in the process, yes. Uh, that was, the, that was my, one, my one thing, like, hey, okay, you may be able to beat my puzzle, but you'll still, have to, you'll still activate the trap because it didn't get the proper offering. It had the right weight, but it wasn't the right stuff. So, um, they, they, uh, the trap goes off, and it turns out the trap is actually a giant steam trap. Those um, giant statues that I told you were facing each other um, on, that, on that back area. Those statues release a stream of steam from their mouths, and it just, like, shoots straight at the players. And um, they are pretty much, I think, like, Sindal and Fang, or maybe just Fang. Or one or two of them is, like, forced down the stairs, which I believe then, like, snaps shut. And they kind of tumble down the stairs, and they hit another trap at the bottom of the stairs, which um, starts pouring water into the room, which is now like a little, essentially like a little sarcophagus, just, you know, sealed off down there. And it's essentially the water from above it fills up like a reservoir, and it falls through these grates now, and that's the trap. It fills up this room with water. Well, again, Fang's earthbending was incredibly useful, and again, I was not thinking about it at all when I was designing these traps. 
Yes, there's these, um, there's metal grates. He asks us about the grates. Are those stone grates? Can I do anything with those? Like, no, they're metal grates. You can't, you can't fuck with those. Um, they're just, uh, the water's pouring through them. You can't stop it. He's like, what about, what about this passage they're traveling down? That's not metal too, is it? And I was like, well, no, I guess that would probably be stone. He's like, well, if it's stone, I'm going to just close it. And I was just like, shoot. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That works. Yep. Not even, you don't have to roll for it. That's okay. You can do that very easily. Just whoop, whoop, whoop. And then he closes off the water, and then the trap is disabled, and he can use his earthbending to quickly open the secret door that slams shut on them, and they are able to, to examine the room. Wild monsters, uh, an underground dungeon, secret rooms and traps. This is sounding a lot like a Dungeons & Dragons game all of a sudden, isn't it? Well, yes, I, I wrote this episode to kind of be like a Dungeons & Dragons game. I felt like my players might have been missing some of those those elements of the game, and so I wanted to create a, a small dungeon for them to explore. And that's why I had a riddle, that's why I had traps, random animals, and that is why, once they found the hidden room, there was like a bunch of random loot that didn't even really make a lot of sense for why it was down there, or why it was in, you know, perfect condition, but, but hey, they got some free loots. So there was two bags, as you can see on the table over there, and they opening those bags, they found um, not another trap, but just a bunch of stuff. Um, in the first bag, there were two war fans. There was a boomerang that was incredibly sharp. Uh, there was a set of tiger head hook swords, and then a set of light twin dao. In the second bag, there were 20 daggers, 20 shuriken, and 20 shattering arrows. I believe that Tiki... Uh, picked up the arrows, and I think that she might have grabbed the boomerang as well, seeing as it's like a water tribe weapon. I'm pretty sure Sindal grabbed the daggers, and he might have also grabbed the shuriken and the tiger the tiger hooks, as I like to call them. And I'm, I know that Fang picked up the Dao, and I'm pretty sure Pema picked up the war fans, because as an airbender, she's a proficient with war fans as a weapon. And that was pretty much the session. They found all of that cool loot, they, they cleared out the dungeon, they, they uh, managed to to solve the riddle, and um, they brought the water back to the temple, which is what was causing the attacks. That was the, that's, the, uh, that's the end of it, pretty much. They, they managed to solve it. Um, in the future, these, the spirit has been placated, and now these attacks uh, cease to have occur. Personally, I just want to say this was probably like one of my favorite episodes that I ever did. Um, I just enjoyed it a lot, um, especially the the second half of the temple combat. That was like my, my favorite part. I just felt like my players were really engaging with each other. They were really thinking and having to plan, and um, they were they were. I just felt like they were really engaging with the system, like the, more than they had than anyone had the whole time. And so this is one of my top favorite episodes, definitely top three. Um, so they went back to town after they had cleared the temple. They enjoyed a nice feast. They were praised by the villagers, etc., etc., for all of the, the wonderful things they had done. They saved the village. They told the, the village mayor or elder or whoever about this temple. And they were like, hey, you uh, might need to go to this temple and make offerings occasionally. You might need to keep an eye on this place because that we're pretty sure that's why the spirit was attacking your village because no one was going to the temple. And so the, the mayor, elder guy, he's like, yeah, I, we can try to do that. You know, it might be difficult because of the royal decree, but seeing as, you know, it's, it's to prevent the spirit from becoming angry with us again, we will certainly try to make an effort uh, to provide an offering to the spirit. And that was pretty much the, that was pretty much the whole episode. Next episode, they're going to be flying, um, they're really close to Hun Ro, but there's still one more short adventure first. They need to go to the small village of Pin Yao, and there they are going to be fighting an unliving enemy. That'll be your teaser until next week. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope to see you soon.